Kuzu Zampo and a very warm welcome to all the viewers who are catching us from home. I am here at the Center for Bhutan and Gross National Happiness Studies. I would like to introduce and welcome my guest, who is His Eminence, Kalu Rinpoche. My first question to Rinpoche is, is, is a question that I ask all my guests when I used to host the Chanchu Shingla. Okay. And the question is, who is the Buddha? I did share with Rinpoche at that okay. time that uh, my questions are not going to be okay. hard okay, okay. <laughs> or difficult. So okay. if Rinpoche could share with us, who is the Buddha? Okay. Mm. Uh, first of all, Tashitele, to all of you. Um, Buddha, from my understanding, from my limited clarity that I have, is that in a relative level, uh, Buddha is the one that we've seen and the witness and the story and then also the one that who have achieved the enlightenment um, in Bodhgaya. Mm -hmm. That's the Buddha that we know, that we see. But the real Buddha is Dhammakaya itself. That is an exemplary figure for yeah. us to follow his footstep so that we can also achieve uh, the ultimate happiness and enlightenment over the time. Yes. Yes. So that kind of understanding is probably quite important. And Rimuche, a follow-up on that I would like to ask is because the reason for asking this is most of us as Buddhists, mm. uh, you can say culturally born Buddhists or traditionally born into Buddhist families, mm. especially here in the Himalayas, mm. we are born into this family and then we, we, we have the annual pujas, the mm. chokus, we have the tzechus. But seldom do we find ourselves asking these questions and how important does do you feel, Rimuche? Because this question, if I may go, uh, a backstory of this question is, I had the good fortune of being in an audience with His Holiness, the Dalai Lama. Mm -hmm. And he gave a special audience to the Bhutanese population mm -hmm. one time in, during the Kala Chakra mm -hmm. empowerment. Mm -hmm. And at that point, uh, His Holiness started the talk by saying, even spelling out the word, and for me, as, as an audience member in that teaching, I found it, I was blown away to think that how mm. I had spent so much of my life mm. not even contemplating or reflecting upon the fact mm -hmm. that who is the Buddha. And if Rimuchi can share with us that is it, is it, is it a practice or is it allowed in Buddhism? The reason why I ask this in, in other world beliefs, there are restrictions to what you can can you question who is Allah, or can you question who is Christ, or can you question mm -hmm. who is Bhagwan? So in Buddhism, if Rimuche can share with us, mm -hmm. is, is it a practice, is it allowed for us to question who is the Buddha? Of course it is allowed, because even the Buddha himself, like you had an opportunity uh, to meet with His Holiness, that you had a conversation with him, and it is a very common answer that he gives all the time, throughout the social media, and when there's a big event, he says, we are the follower of the Buddha, but it doesn't mean that you have to follow blindly, you know, you have to base on the logic reason, as well as a spiritual progress on your own, not just questioning everything, mm -hmm. but at the same time making a progress with the meditation, with the analytical meditation as well. That sort of approach is very much important, yes. you know. So, you know, like an example, the Buddha itself, you know, has been accumulating his positive accumulation for three eons, you know. And then whether you uh, believe that or not, doesn't matter. The most important is this single lifetime, that the final lifetime, symbolically, and uh, just before reaching the enlightenment, for our eyes to believe it and to follow that example, uh, you know, that itself is overwhelming for an individual like ourselves, you know. Six years, you know, without any consumption of any sort of food and simply meditating, you know, but even that sort of a realized being, even that sort of a hardship uh, that individual had gone through, uh, whether his name is Buddha or not, you know, his teaching was definitely helpful. But at the same time, due to his infinite wisdom, he always says that you can always question my teachings, you should always debate, analyze, and then follow it, not blindly. Yes. You know, because even in the time of Buddha, there was already many religions existed. Yes. You know, not just in the 21st century, there's so many religions. Back then, there's so many religions that existed. Over the time, it dissolved, and yes. over the time, there's a new belief and faith, yes. you know, um, come to place, you know, to, throughout the society. And Rimuchi, Rimuchi spoke about, uh, right now, about the six-year penance that the historical mm -hmm. Buddha Shakyamuni mm -hmm. did. Mm -hmm. Along those lines, uh, 
one thing which is uh, which comes to mind is, is uh, with regard to Miller Reba as well, mm -hmm. also the amount of hardship that he had to mm -hmm. go through. And while the the very founder of Buddhism mm -hmm. himself went through so hardship, so much mm -hmm. hardship, and Miller Reba also went through mm -hmm. hardship, we and uh, uh, people who are familiar or who, who we can call it tourists of Buddhism and we are trying to seek, okay. explore Buddhism. No? Okay. At, at that level, when you look, you always find that there is a term called the middle path. Okay. And while uh, there is a deeper meaning, a more profound meaning to what Uma means and mm -hmm. what the middle path is, okay. uh, on a very relative level for most of us followers, we think that um, middle path means something in moderation, mm -hmm. that you don't really need to go through hardship. Mm -hmm. And the Buddha himself, after his six years, mm -hmm. after he, he he was fed the, the kheer, mm -hmm. I, I, don't, I don't know if it, it was kheer, okay. by uh, uh, the Damze Pum, uh, yes, Ekiman yes, yes. Sujata. Yes. So after that, Buddha is famously supposed to have said that you don't need to do all those hardships. Mm -hmm. If Rimuchi could share some opinion uh, about that, about the middle path, and what are we to understand with regard to moderation, with okay. regard to Buddhist, the Buddha Dharma? I think number one is that I will share my own experience. I will That's not right. assume on things that what I've read. Yes. Um, so from my own personal experience, I think whether we live and believe in this idea of we have to be very traditional as a Buddhist practitioner or whether we want to be very modern as a Buddhist practitioner, regardless of you have a different approach and ideas about how Buddhism should be in the 21st century, I think the most important, the middle ground, the foundation is having a sense of reflection on oneself is very much important. With the lack of reflection on oneself, with the lack of awareness on oneself, as well as a renunciation. Yes. If you don't have a renunciation, and then there's no realization. Yes. The renunciation doesn't have to go through hardship, doesn't have to go through um, extreme suffering. Renunciation simply needs a clarity in your mind. When you have more clarity as you meditate further, the renunciation and how you renounce the samsaric world happens eventually over the time. If you try to forcefully, you know, trying to challenge yourself, trying to force yourself, that will simply exhaust you over the time. Like an example, the difference between the Milarepa and the Buddha Shakyamuni yes. is that they have seen everything, gone through everything, and they have no illusion of the samsara whatsoever. Yes. They have no second opinion. Yes. You know, we have a second opinion. Yes. That's a big gap between them and us. You know, like an example, the Miller Rebbe, he have committed certain wrongdoing yes. in a relative level, yes. um, and then he had this immense remorse and guilt and regret. And due to that profound understanding of oneself wrongdoing and being sincere of their own mistake, yes. sincere of their own wrongdoing, that is very important. Because many of us, when we say we are Buddhist practitioner, we just simply believe that reading, praying, meditating is the key to be a Buddhist practitioner. Yes, definitely that is true. But the principle is to be sincere with oneself, to be honest with oneself. Not necessarily you have to be honest to your neighbors right away, yes. uh, but you honest. Yeah, yes. you can get there slowly. Yes. Yes. But then sincerity and honesty with oneself and a sense of renunciation. And then when you have a renunciation, and then there's a less self-centered attitude. As there's a less self-centered attitude, there's a space to understand new realm of reality of the condition of your own state of mind. As you have that understanding of the new condition and the new reality uh, of mind, and then you, you, you are able to understand and experience the meaning of the subtle body and the subtle mind. Yes. When you're able to understand the subtle body, subtle mind, you also understand the very existence of the illusion. You know, and the appearance of the illusion, impact of the illusion, yes. as you will be able to experience, not just theory, you know, not just a theory in your mind. Yes. And then, when you're able to uh, understand that slowly, and then the, whether it's the middle ground, or, you know, the middle path, or whether it's a, you know, Chakchen or Dzogchen or whatever the traditional belief may be, that will eventually will come in place. Yes. But in the beginning, sincerity to oneself, and, and then having some sort of a gap from the self-centered attitude. And a sense of renunciation bit by bit, that will make a big difference because that was the key to reach to enlightenment. Without a reflection to the samsara, without the meaning of the renunciation along with your spiritual journey, there's no enlightenment. You know. Vajrayana Buddhism, mm -hmm. how, how is it different from so called 
before the popular term was Hinayana, but then that, I believe, in the interest of being diplomatically correct, has now been changed to Theravada. And from Theravada, now I hear that it's called the basic vehicle. Mm. So Hinayana or Theravada or basic vehicle, whatever mm. the name is, that mm -hmm. is the path of the individual seeker. Mm -hmm. And besides that, there is the Mahayana mm -hmm. and Vajrayana. So if Rinpoche could share something about what makes Vajrayana special, or is Vajrayana special? <laughs> I, I personally, I don't think it is special just because somebody is speaking on the behalf of the Vajrayana ideas. Yes. You know, yes. you can say it's special, you know. You can say the gold is so much valuable, yes. you know, but if the person doesn't have the basic brain to function, <laughs> it is absolutely meaningless, yes. you know. So, so I think it is very much important. Like an example, it's not about just uh, Theravada or the Mahayana or the Vajrayana. Uh, like the Buddha himself, we have the, all the manifestation of the um, Bodhisattva, Yidam, protectors. All these are manifestation of the Buddha himself in the, from, the, from the state of the Dhammakaya. It's just so that in our relative level, certain Bodhisattva, they have a feminine figure. Some Bodhisattva, they have masculine figure. Some Bodhisattva, they have more passive figure or, or feature or appearance. And some of them, they have uh, different arms and objects and so on. Yes. But the most important of the, of the practice of the Vajrayana is to reduce the fixation in the ordinary level so that we can experience over the time the nature of the mind. And that is the purpose, you know. But, uh, but from my understanding, like I said before, just because somebody says Vajrayana is very special doesn't make it. You know, like an example, Telupa, you know, uh, carrying, picking up his slipper and hitting on the Narupa. Yes. You know, I think if you do that right now, <laughs> you will get into trouble. Yes. You know, so trying to copy the great master's method is not really going to work. Uh, but simply considering yourself never as a teacher, but as a practitioner oneself, and seeing other person or individual as a practitioner. Seeing oneself as a practitioner, like an example, he saw the next Dalai Lama, he says, I'm a simple Buddhist monk. He's the head of the Vajrayana, Theravada, Mahayana, whatever the Buddhist school, you know, the Vajrayana, uh, the lineage or the tradition, you name it, he's the head of that, you know. Then, still, he says, I'm, I'm a simple Buddhist, Buddhist monk. Yes. You know, he doesn't say that without reason. So even to the highest realized being has that kind of a statement and attitude, that means Ourself as a Vajrayana practitioner, whether we are in Bhutan or in Nepal or in India or in Tibet or anywhere around the world, yes. you know, I think seeing oneself as an ordinary being, a practitioner, is very important, and seeing the teachings of the Lord Buddha as a, a different method for the different individual, rather than saying this is lower practice, this is a higher practice, and putting a hierarchy within the Lord Buddha's teaching is absolutely meaningless. Yes. Like an example. Some people, when they come to a Buddhist society group, they say, I've done a preliminary practice 100,000 times. I have achieved this 200,000 times. But if you look at the history of the great masters, right, who have reached the enlightenment by accumulating 100,000 times? Nobody. Yes. You know, that was made up over the time. Yes. As know, a skillful means. As a skillful means. But it doesn't mean that it can help everybody. Yes. For some, it is absolutely useless. It, it is even <laughs> discouraging. It just built, the ego more. Exactly. It's even discouraging. And that's why, uh, you know, for me, uh, you know, counting the, in not counting the, the practice, but rather simply being with one, with the visualization, with the meditation or the yoga practice, is far more beneficial. But my faith towards Buddhism, my dedication, my devotion to the Dharma didn't change, never will be changed. Conferences like the Vajrayana conference that mm. Rinpoche is going to also be a part of in the coming days. Mm -hmm. How important do you feel such conferences are? I find that very, very important. Yes. Yes. Because when we have a many monastic institution, it gets caught up in the hierarchical position of who says what and what they hold and who is in the position of holding what sort of responsibility. And it creates a different world uh, in your own. And then you get, you get cut off from the reality of what people are going through. Yes. What people are going through in terms of suffering. People are going through divorce, people are going through depression, people go through lack of job, people go through 
not having enough money to pay rent. Yes. You know, so they go through a lot of diff different challenges and different difficulties. You can't tell them that everything is impermanent. Yes. You know, and then when they have this kind of a different uh, social challenges, the one thing that Buddhism should do is how to decrease their stress, their anxiety, and their concern you know, of their worldly things. Yes. We should help them, ease it, you know, rather than saying, that's samsara. You know, that's, that's basically just blaming them and, and being irresponsible. And I think when you do this kind of a conference, you are blocking the idea of one guru is very important, but rather bringing different kind of teachers and traditions yes. uh, you know, together and also to, ex you know, to exchange and to share the experience rather than going against each other. Yes. And I think that is very, very important because if you look back in the history, so many religions, not just Buddhist, but so many different religions in the West, Middle East, and also in the Himalaya region, there has been a lot of conflict. But One when of you the most major wars in the exactly. world in shared history has been for over religion. Yes, yes. So like when you when the Vajrayana conference is held like that, you know, and it's not you know, separated by what is your nationality or what is your culture background. It is more to do with what can you offer? Yes. What can you offer to make other people life a little bit better? Yes. You know, by giving the importance of Buddhism at the same time. You know, not just not just trying something new age sort of a thing. Yes. You know, so I find that very helpful. And that's what I've been um, trying to do myself as well, because I look after my meditation center around the world. It is very helpful for a certain individual who are already devoted to a Buddhist practitioner, uh, as a Buddhist practitioner. But then in order to reach out to the ordinary working people, yes. you know, who has their family life and who lives in the city or who lives in the countryside, whatever the social status may be, they need something in the middle ground where they can approach, yes. where there's a less religious and cultural boundary, yes. you know. Yes. And that's why, uh, you know, to create such platform, uh, it's very much important. It will help so many people. Yes. And I'm so happy to be here. Yes. And, and Rinpoche, I wanted to ask you about uh, Shangpa Kajula. Okay. I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly. Oh, yes, yes, please. Yes, of yes. course. Because Rimuchi is known, even your predecessor, mm. the late Kalu Rimuchi, was also known as, uh, to, to most people, known as a Kaju mm -hmm. But then, uh, when I was doing my homework to interview Rimuchi today, mm -hmm. I came across Shangpa Kaju. And, and although we do hear that mm -hmm. from Chege Gambobala, mm -hmm. after him, uh, Kaju sects, there were eight major, and mm -hmm. I, I think four, four major. Chie Shi Chungje. Plus, mm -hmm. plus. So, Rinpoche can share something about the, the Kaju tradition, okay. especially with regard to Shangpa Kaju for the audience members who okay. are unfamiliar. Uh, first of all, all the teachings that we know as a Vajrayana Buddhist is all linked with uh, Buddha Shakyamuni when he transformed himself in the Kala Chakra. Yes. You know, so that is all linked to that. Yes. There's no such thing as, uh, you know, something that is made up a few centuries ago. Yes. You know, whether we consider ourselves as a Nyingma, Sacha, Gelu, Kaju, Chonang, Shangpa, and also here, Tupa Kaju. You know, all yes. of it has linked with the Buddha Shakyamuni. That's the one thing. Yes, that's uh, an important th thing. Like that's a very important yes. thing. So it's not like a different agenda, yes, you know, that we are going against each other or any sort of thing like exactly. that. Um, and then, of course, um, the, the Kaju Che Shi Chungje is uh, it's a separate lineage that is linked with the Gambopa and the Telopa and Naropa uh, and Marpa Mela Gambopa. That's it. And then from the Gambopa lineage, and then there's a you know a vast different lineage within the within the Kajupa sect. But the Shangpa Kaju is not really originated from the Gambopa at all. Yes. Shangpa Kaju has been existed parallelly around the same time because during the Songzen Gampo time yes. there was a, a, a flourish of Buddhist, Buddhist ideas as Guru Rinpoche traveled to Tibet and later on Guru Rinpoche also you know, uh, manifest himself as a Dorje Tolu in Bar yes. you know, so we have all this different manifestation of Guru Rinpoche you know. so in the time of Guru Rinpoche of course there was a noble king, emperor um, but then there was a there was an age of decline yes. um, of um, Buddhist teachings. Langdharma. Yes, Langdharma. Yes. Um, 
And then during that time, many people still seek for the spiritual path, knows about Buddhism. And uh, the Chungpo Nanjo, he actually was a Bempo practitioner until he was 50 years old. Always. Uh, but he, since he was young, he always had this prophecy. The Indian sadhu came to his home nice. and then gave a nectar blessing and said, this boy will go to India, yes. will receive all the teachings from 150 masters. He will bring back to Tibet and he will spread the teachings of the Buddha in the four different directions, fearless as a lion itself. Yes. And that, so that was the prophecy. Yes. But the prophecy tended to be, uh, yeah, how do I say? Quite a long time. Quite a long time, you know. Yes. So until he was 50 years old, he was a bimbo. Uh, and then after that, he became, um, um, uh, how do I say, uh, Kadamba practitioner, yes. uh, which is the lineage of the Atisha. Yes. You know, yes. so he was, for a while, he was a practitioner of that. And then after a few months and years, then he went across the border to Nepal. He went to India. And then um, he received teachings from uh, the Niguma. And she is the elder sister of Naropa. Um, so she herself, her guru is Saraha, and as well as a Vajadara in her ultimate level in terms of connection. And, um, and then the other teachers that he had was a Sukhasiddhi, also happened to be another Indian lady. So both of them, they are uh, like a Dakini enlightened being uh, and a great practitioner enlightened being. And then they, she gave all the teachings of the Shambhakaju. And when you say Shambhakaju, it's a collective different method of teachings. Uh, like an example, uh, the Shampa lineage holds the lineage of the Chakrasambhara yes. practice, the yes. five tantric deities, yes. and as well as the lineage of the six Amahakala, yes. and the lineage of the six yogas of Sukhasiddhi, yes. and the six yogas of Niguma, yes. and as well as the five jewels of Niguma. Yes. So these, all these five combined, is seen as a Shambhakaju. Yes. So the, later on, you know, when he went back to Tibet, and then um, the way he settled, you know, was the Shang province oh, or region, yes, nice. just like a Gambopa. Oh, you nice. know, Gambopa is the, the, the name of the mountain and the hat oh, and nice. replica, you know, like an example, the Tupakaju nice. has the replica of the mountain. Nice. You know, so many of the masters, you know, their lineage name is based on where they have spent the time most. But when, since I was very young, um, I, had, I had not so much ideas about the Shampa lineage. Yes. I was just, you know, going into the monastery and studying. Um, but when I was in the retreat, I opened the text of the Shampa lineage, uh, Master Chungpo Nanjo. And when I read that history, I, I couldn't hold my tears back. It was like reconnecting to that story. You know, little, you feel like you know that story. Yes. And then I couldn't lie to myself. Yes. And the, from the age of uh, 15, I, I said to myself, I will dedicate my life fully to the Shampa lineage. Yes. Yes. And then when I researched even further, then my predecessor, he actually, he did the three years retreat um, in the Shampa tradition yes. uh, when he was uh, 14 years old, same as me. Yes. You know, so, uh, so, and then also he established the three years retreat because previous Kalorama he was the first uh, Vajrayana master who traveled to the West and who have established a three years retreat tradition yes. for male and female oh, in the 1970s. Yes, ahead of his time. Yes. Yeah. So I try to continue that legacy because when you say lineage, it's not so much to do with the bloodline, you know. Yes. It's more, you know yes. yeah, so it's more to do with uh, um, how much you have dedicated fully into the Dharma and what you have understood and how you can help other people, yes. you know, yes. genuinely. You know, so that is the essence of the lineage, and that comes down to the practitioner during retreat. You know? Yes, yes. So, so. And with regard to to, to that, mm -hmm. uh, one thing because Rimuchi, I would like to firstly thank on behalf of the audience for giving us such an elaborate history mm -hmm. of how the Shampa mm -hmm. uh, lineage came into being. Mm -hmm. But uh, one question that I wanted to ask Rimuchi with was with regard to the Vajrayana conference mm -hmm. and also the fact that. This ancient, if we, one can call it with love and respect, mm -hmm. this ancient wisdom that is Buddhism, mm -hmm. how, how relevant is it to this day and age? Rimuchi did share about, touched upon the fact that Buddhism needs to help people, people mm -hmm. who can't meet their ends, people who are divorced, who are going through depression, mm -hmm. and all these yeah. situations. So if Rimuchi can share something on, on that regard. Mm -hmm. Like when, when, when you have this so-called lineage, 
Yes. You know, it has a transmission lineage, it has an empowerment lineage. Um, it is very helpful when it comes to a few individuals who really want to dedicate fully and not looking back anything in life and want to practice their whole life. Yes. And everything makes sense. Yes. Uh, but like you said, you know, in order to bring more in a relative level to help other people is nowadays, you know, people go through uh, depression. And myself, I've gone through a depression yes. with a lot of betrayal um, in my inner circle, in my early age, when I started the responsibility. Yes. Uh, because when you have a name, there's a value. When there's a value, there's a politics. Yes. And when there's politics, there's a different interest, yes. people yes. surrounding you. And then when you brought up in a monastery, you don't have a management training, you know? Yes. You are told, be good, <laughs> you know? Yes. Be kind, be loving. Yes. Everything will be fine, you know? Uh, but when you wake up in the reality after the, you know, taking the responsibility, it doesn't function like that, you know. You spend a lot of time with a lawyer. <laughs> you spend a lot of time individual by individual by helping them. You know, putting a boomba on their head is not going to fix their problem. But certain individual, you have to sit down and listen to them, you know. And I think that is important. And talking about how you can bring the teachings of the Buddha, teachings of the Shampa lineage in a more relevant level is by introducing the Jibhuma Yoga itself. Because when she taught the, the five jewels of Niguma teaching, heat generating practice, clear light, clear light practice, dream yoga practice, power practice, part of practice, you know. When she taught all of the five jewels and the six yogas of Niguma to Chumbananda, she said, do not teach any of these things until the seventh generation of the lineage holder. Yes, I did come across that. Yes. For seven generations, the lineage was supposed to be given to just One a single individual. Exactly. So after the seventh lineage holder, then you can share public. Then that is when the Shampa lineage became very popular, yes. you know, during that time. Yes. And so... Uh, so the popularity of Shampa, the flourishing of that, actually happened after the seventh generation. Yes. When it was revealed to a bigger audience. Exactly. So there was a time that where Chungpa Nanjo, you know, because he's a great scholar, meditator, and he was known as the Mahasiddha of Tibet, yes. which is not really the common title that you get, you know, because... At that point in time, for somebody who's Tibetan. Yes, Because exactly. most of the Panditas and everybody was Indian. Exactly. So he's known as Pandita and Mahasiddha and Yogi, enlightened being. Yes. And there was a time that, you know, he held, he had 108 stupas and the temples and so on. Uh, but then there was, a, there was a certain generation of decline in terms of populari popularity, but in terms of the lineage, it maintained the blessing, the protection and the, from the protector of the Mahakala and the Kandruma as well. Yes. And on the seventh lineage holder, it became public. So, uh, talking about the relevant level, is that, you know, me, my, me myself, I practice Niguma Yoga. I know when you go travel around the world and looking after a meditation center, meeting people, uh, and then you go through so many different challenges. Uh, and then you have a lot of stress in your mind, you have a lot of, you know, uh, because not every center is a meditation center is a peaceful place. Every meditation center has a different challenges. Some places are in debt, some places are in the political turmoil, mm -hmm. and some Dharma center there in the kind of division state. So you have to solve that, being patient, and you have to be passive. You have to be kind, at the same time you have to be decisive. Yes. You know, so all that doesn't really work together very well unless you have an inner peace, you know. So when you have an inner peace, and the search of inner peace actually started even further after the retreat, and I started doing this Niguma Yoga, yes. and it has been very, very helpful to me. Yes. And, and then I, I was doing you know, the yoga every day for almost one year, you know, preparation for this event as well on the top of that, yes. you know, and uh, it helped my mind to be more clear, to be more calm, and also how I interact with my responsibility and with other individuals, you know, and in terms of the Dharma practice, it helped me a lot, yes. you know, so if it can help me, it can help other people, yes. Yes. you know, I'm a human being, they're a human being, you know, yes. so my title is just a name yes. that doesn't, you know, make anybody enlightenment. But if there's a quality development that I have, and if I can share and help other people, and you know, 
why not? Yes. You know, because you know, uh, in Indian culture, you have a hatha yoga, yes. and many people they they explore the hatha yoga yes. and they do all sorts of yoga, and then after that they seek a spirituality. You know, so if we as a Buddhist, whether I'm a Shampa lineage or the any sort of a lineage, if we can contribute in a physical and a mental well-being for the society, and that itself will hold the tradition and the culture uh, of each nation. Yes. You know, uh, otherwise having too much concern and being panicking everywhere yes. and how to modernizing it, it doesn't really help unless you give them to something to experience by themselves because many people, they drink you know, alcohol, they consume many different things to make them feel alive or they want to switch off. Yes. So, they have the, yeah. so they have two extreme, you know. Yes. So when you give them yoga, you're not telling them to worship me, I'm your guru. Yes. You're telling them to experience your own breath you're telling them to experience your own body. You're telling them to experience their own air yes. and to be mindful. Yes. You know, so when you have that kind of a, uh, experience to see deeper in oneself, there's a definitely a positive help. Yes. You know? yes. so. And um, I wanted to share with the audience that Jumuchi is presenting the Nukuma Yoga in, in the conference yes. for the wider audience, and I can't. Wait, I'm, 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 I'm very <laughs> eager and I've been interested for a long time to yes. find out about what the Nibuma Yoga is. Yes, yes. And it, it, it's fortunate for all of us that the Center for Bhutan, uh, Center for Bhutan and Gross National Happiness Studies is making it, uh, giving Rimuche yes. uh, this, uh, uh, this platform where yes. you can reach a wider audience, especially yes. here in Bhutan and the rest of the world. Exactly. And uh, while we are, I, I'm being reminded by the producer that we are running out of time. Okay. I would also like to uh, ask Rimuchi because as I was asking Rimuchi about the relevance of Buddhism mm -hmm. in this day and age mm -hmm. and the beauty of Rimuchi's mm -hmm. style, if I can call it that, okay. style or okay. your approach of teaching okay. is the fact that you personalize everything mm -hmm. and you give the example of yourself mm -hmm. and so much of your dharma and your teaching what I've come across comes across as a testimonial of what you yourself have personally gone through. Mm -hmm. And I think it, 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 it suffices to, for the audience and as for me to say that if it works for Rinpoche, mm -hmm. uh, it, it should work for anybody else. But about this, this secret dharma and who can hear it and who can't hear it, mm -hmm. if Rinpoche can share briefly about that, although mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's difficult for me to first of all ask this question and secondly mm -hmm. to even attach the fact mm -hmm. to share it briefly. Mm -hmm. There's no such thing as secret, you know, it's just yes. the idea of the secrecy is that other people may misunderstood. That is the core point. Yes. You know, other people may misunderstood this method of visualization, this method of practice, you know. Like an example, can you control all the pictures of the Vajakilaya that is surfacing on the internet? Yes. You can't, you know, it's already past that line. Yes, that's you know, right. your argument is true at a certain period of time, but it is irrelevant no. to the world that we live in because everything we communicate, everything we share, everything is in social media. Yes. You know, so, you know, like an example, all the, the deities that we see, all the pictures, first of all, it should never be, uh, be known by general public in the first place. To begin with. Yeah, to begin with let alone talk about it. But, uh, but starting with His Holiness Dalai Lama, and he gives the Kala Chakra the highest Tantra teachings and empowerment. And then, you know, as long as you have a pure intention, and if the person who's learning has a pure intention, all is good, you know. And if you have a negative intention, even I give you a piece of, you know, teachings, it is still incorrect, you know. Yes, yes. So I think that sort of a mindset is very important. If you have a pure intention, you're not going to misuse it. Yes. You're not going to misrepresent. You're not going to take advantage of other people. Yes. You're not going to bring that in an uh, in a abuse of power yes. to manipulate or influence other people for your own self-interest. Yes. You know, you will practice it for your own benefit. And based upon your own realization, you will benefit other people along your journey in life. You know, so so idea of the secrecy is not really important. Yes. You know, but the the way it is introduced, yes. the way it is practiced, has to be understood very clearly. 